Yeah, so we, um, the title basically reflects uh, the idea that, uh, well, one aspect is that Texas droughts turn to endless floods, but uh, in, in particular here looking at um, how different indices and different tools represent uh, the end of a drought. Next slide. So here is uh, all the droughts since 1895, according to the Climate Division data, um, plotting the Palmer Drought Severity Index. Um, the drought, the timeline spans about seven years. The real long one is the drought of the 1950s. The thick black line is the uh, 2010 to 2015 drought. Uh, the Palmer Drought Index finally went positive in March. Um, but Texas is a big state, and characterizing the condition of drought throughout the state with one number is not really a good idea. So that's basically what motivated our project. Next. So what we want to do is get down to as fine a scale as possible with uh, drought monitoring. And there are four ingredients to this. First off, the stage four precipitation analyses that the river forecast centers produce, which gives us precipitation. And you can do percent of normal, but you don't really know how unusual a particular percent of normal is. So you need to make a drought index out of that. And uh, you can do that using historical observations of a long enough time period to get the basic PDF or the statistical parameters that describe the PDF, but those are point locations um, to fill in the uh, gap and get a, get a representative spatial analysis. We use the climate normals from the PRISM analysis, which is, is high resolution and presumably accurate in the normal sense. Uh, you may ask why we don't just use PRISM the whole way out, and that's because even though the in information is provided at high resolution, it's still constrained by the uh, spacing of the available gauges. So we use the normals from prison and the statistical parameters of higher moments from the co-op observations. And then to represent this, we started with the STI, but have made a slight modification to that, which we think works a little bit better, which I'll describe in a moment. Next slide. Right now we're um, in phase three. We developed a prototype in Texas, then we got the uh, funding from USDA to partner with NC State and Purdue to take it um, quasi-nationally. And now we're um, in the process of refining the technique to um, make it uh, suitable as an operational project, product and even uh, feed uh, land surface models with the high resolution information. Next. So um, I'm going to take you on a quick tour of the Texas drought using basically phase two quality drought index information from our project. Uh, we're using what we call the SPI blend, which is the SPI calculated not just for a single time period, say six months or three months, but actually for a range of time periods which has some nice properties that I don't have time to get into here, but I can answer questions about it. And because there's a range of time periods involved and multiple different time periods can be defined, what we're going to show you here is the minimum value of the SPI blend um, from time periods that ranges from two months to two years. So you can think of it as the, the worst uh, level of drought, whether it's short term or long term. Next slide. So these are of course, rooted in radar data, although they're gauge calibrated manually. Um, and uh, you, you see the, the colors in, in yellow and red correspond to the U.S. Drought Monitor categories. So we're converting the SPI to the percentiles for the U.S. Drought Monitor. The lowest 2% is exceptional dryness, lowest 5% extreme dryness, and so forth. And then at the other end of the PDF, uh, similar percentiles apply to unusually wet conditions. Um, Next. So what we're going to look at here is the evolution of drought, which really started in October, but doesn't show up long enough time period until December. January was the only wet month in the entire first 12 months of the drought. And it was, uh, of course, uh, quite intense in the spring and, and only got worse during the summer. We tied the record for, with, with Oklahoma, we share it, for the hottest, 12, hottest summer on record broke our record for the driest 12 months on record by a large margin. 
And at this point, it was pretty easy to characterize drought. It was exceptional just about everywhere. Go on. Now, as we look forward, we start seeing some improvements, and the drought monitor the tool that we're developed here comes comes into its own, really, because you start seeing lots of spatial structure as different locations pick up rain and get see improvements. Um, we're transitioning here from shorter term to longer term drought, so changes don't happen very rapidly. But then we had a short dry period, like just crept in at the end of 2012, can pretty rapidly get. Um, exceptional dryness spreading on the short term, but that then can go away pretty quickly when it rains again. Next. So now we're uh, into the third year of the drought, and uh, it's now become rather patchy. Uh, the area in the Panhandle and a little bit down the Red River is one of the worst hard hit places. The other place that's notable is Austin. You see that green patch. Um, sort of just to the lower right of the center of the map, uh, that's the Onion Creek flood, which um, produced uh, um, up to 10 inches of rainfall in a short period of time. But Austin's uh, water supply is from reservoirs that are located one to two counties to the west, where conditions were still dry. So the 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 local meteorological drought was different from the drought that people were experiencing at this point. Next. Um, and as time went on, really, agriculture did pretty well. Most of the issues were hydrologic, but drought had one more kick for the panhandle. You see an exceptionally dry springtime. Uh, fortunately, it's not the rainy season there. Rainy season is summer, and the very next week, they got some nice precipitation, which got things going back on track. Uh, from here on out, it's mainly improvements. Uh, we're getting to the end of 2014, and uh, we basically have a wet month and a dry month, wet month and dry month. You can see some parts of the state are exceptionally wet, while other parts are still exceptionally dry at this point. And now we're into May, which is what well, turns out to have been the wettest month ever in Texas by a two-inch margin. And uh, the even though we're looking at the lowest SPI value or the percentile equivalent, Majority of the state is actually on the plus side. Next frame. And uh, that continued to improve. Next. Next slide. And uh, finally, this last one shows the uh, current conditions where you're hard pressed to find any um, dry values except in the Trans Pecos region where there's poor radar coverage. Um, that last little artifact there is an indication of why we still need to um, apply. Um, what we're, do, what we're doing from phase two to phase three to, to uh, eliminate the sort of lingering artifacts that basically show up strongly when you're taking a product that was designed to be looked at in a one day snapshot and apply it over a two to three year accumulation. So the, the errors show up because you're beating down the signal to noise ratio for the bias. That means you then can identify those biases accurately and do something about them. Um, next slide. So you, you're seeing the evolution of the drought, and with the product we looked at, it sort of has the same arc as the statewide PDSI, very rapid degradation, and then gradual stop-start improvement. Next slide. But toward the end of the drought, the main impacts were with reservoir levels, and here you can see the history of reservoir levels in Texas. Uh, the black line on top is the conservation storage capacity. I've indicated the start of the drought in late 2010. You can see it took a big dive in 2011, then almost recovered, and then was back low again. And when the PDSI went positive in March, the orange arrow shows that we were still at uh, very low levels compared to the norm. And uh, now we've, we've made up most of that difference. So all of that happened in the past uh, two or three months after the PDSI uh, index indicated the drought was already over. Next. And uh, just briefly highlight a few reservoirs that show that story. First off, Lake Arrowhead, the reservoir supplying Wichita Falls, um, went from 20% uh, of uh, capacity to over 100% in two-week period. Next slide. Um, Palo Pinto Reservoir, again, looking over the past year plus, it was declining. But in fact, they had less than six months of water remaining in the reservoir for the cities that were relying on it for water supply. Again, a couple of weeks and it's full. 
Next slide. And lastly, a lake farther south, Medina Lake, which um, has, has seen a, hasn't gotten full yet, but has seen a bigger in, in, inflow in the past week when it hasn't rained than it had basically during the past year when it when it uh, uh, was still embedded in drought. Next slide. And uh, so um, the drought monitor still had drought in Texas in March because of the reservoir issues. But as you can see, with if you get historic rainfall amounts, you can fill up reservoirs pretty quickly. And so in just two months, we've seen a five-category improvement in uh, parts of north central Texas from, from exceptional drought to uh, not even any lingering dryness. Next slide. So what we're doing with our product right now is um, eliminating artifacts from a radar point of view, starting with the, the things that have particular structures because of how the radar works, things like beam, beam blockage, uh, range-dependent biases, and most of the of those artifacts are going to find, apply a final um, analysis pass on gauge data using the, using the corrected radar data as first guess. Um, to get a high resolution product that is consistent with the gauge data to the extent that's practical, the extent that the gauge data is accurate. Next slide. And so uh, we're, we're about uh, two thirds of the way through that process. So the next step in the remainder of the project is validation and uh, testing this as a uh, four kilometer resolution input for NLDS2. So perhaps help take that down to a finer scale. Um, just leave up my contact information here at the end, and uh, we'll see if there are any questions. Great. Thanks a lot, John, and thanks, Brent, for running the slides. So um, if there are any questions, again, on the line, please use the chat feature or use the raise hand feature, and I will unmute your line so you can ask John. Any questions here in the room for John? Okay, John, I'll just uh, wait a few seconds and see if anything pops up. WebEx. Yeah. And Rita. Hi, John. Uh, can you elaborate a little bit on the advantages of the SPI blend, the different uh, type of indices that you uh, described versus some of the better known SPI type of approach? I'm sure. So, make for example, um, two month SPI would be basically a converted um, uh, estimate of the, the commonness or unusualness of precipitation that happened over the preceding two-month period. But um, hydrologically and, and agriculturally and so forth, the rain, uh, all raindrops are not created equal. The rain that occurred in the past month, week has a bigger impact than the rain that occurred two months ago. So effectively, what our blending does by looking at a range of time scales, say uh, a blend might include one month, two months, and three month uh, accumulation totals all combined and then converted to an SPI. Uh, what that does is it effectively provides a higher weight to the more recent precipitation and a lower weight to the precipitation that was farther back. Um, as a result of that, you don't see the see large artificial jumps in SPI values as major precipitation events suddenly drop off the edge of the SPI interval. Instead, uh, we see the SPI changing gradually as events become farther and farther back in time. And that, that reflects what, what the soil and the, and the system is responding to as well. Uh, John, uh, Marty had a, um, a question here. He said, uh, he asked, is, the rapid, is this rapid recovery typical and linked to time of year? Well, let's see. We've, we only have historical drafts occasionally. Um, so there's really only a two or three, two or three or four event sample size to go on. Um, but um, we set the record, for example, for consecutive uh, two-month rainfall, April and May of this year, at the, which ended this drought. The previous record was April and May of 1957, which ended the drought in the 1950s, which was the most severe drought on record. 
Um, also, um, the driest calendar year was back in 1917, and 1918 was dry also. And uh, in 1919, we had the third or fourth wettest two-month interval, although it was in the fall. So there is possibly something to do with the specific evolution of SST anomalies that, that leads to this particular sequence of events in this part of the United States. But uh, can't really address that with observations. It takes some modeling to tease that out. Okay, thanks, John. Marty, you have any follow-up? You don't want me to ask that other question, but I will. Hey, Amir, did you see this coming? <laughs> <laughs> That's a good enough answer. <laughs> Just teasing. All right. <laughs> Thanks, Marty. Um, so, uh, John, thank you very much for the presentation. It was very interesting. And yeah, thank you, Matt. Okay, great. So, uh, this is the end of the webinar, and I want to thank all four speakers for taking the time to present. I think this was a really, really interesting slate of presentations. Um, and, uh, and really appreciate you taking the time to do this. And thanks to the audience. We had a pretty large audience on the phone today. It looks like about 120 or so folks called in over the course of the webinar. And um, this is also the final webinar in this year's webinar, MAP webinar series. So we'll take a break over the summer and we'll come back in the fall. Um, we have four, I believe, four seasons now of this webinar series and all of the recordings and um, slides are up on our website, so feel free to go back and take a look. Uh, we've explored quite a few topics over the last few years. We've had a few thousand people attend the webinar series. And um, we now have the videos up on YouTube, so it's very easy to stream. You don't have to download some weird um, uh, WebEx uh, software anymore to look at them, so that's a really great uh, development, and um, and I've really appreciated all of the talks over the course of this year, and I'm um, looking forward to next year's webinar series and hope people come back and join again. Thanks. <laughs>